Hey guys, welcome back. On today's video, we're going to review some basic wrist anatomy, and I'll show you how I prefer to do a wrist arthrogram or wrist injection. Let's start with some basic anatomy. Just to orient us, this is the distal radius and distal ulna corresponding to the thumb and pinky fingers of the hand, respectively. The back of the hand and wrist is called the dorsum, and the front is the volar side. Within the wrist itself, there are two rows of carpal bones appropriately described as the proximal and distal carpal rows. Starting from the radial side, the distal row consists of the trapezium, just under the thumb, which is a great way to remember the first ossicle. The trapezium is with the thumb. Next, we have the trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. The proximal row contains the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, and lastly the small pisiform. A series of deep and superficial strong ligaments secure the carpal bones. For the purposes of arthrography, the two most important connect the scaphoid and the lunate, as well as the lunate and triquetrum in the proximal carpal row, appropriately named the scapholunate and lunotriquetrial ligaments, respectively. There is also a V-shaped ligament securing the scaphotrapezium trapezoidal joint that, for the purposes of arthrography, I'm going to simply represent as a single ligament between the scaphoid and trapezium. As you can see, this series of ossicles and their respective ligaments effectively creates two distinct joint spaces of the wrist, the first between the radius and proximal carpal row, called the radiocarpal or proximal wrist joint, and the second between the proximal and distal carpal rows, called the midcarpal joint or distal wrist joint. If all these structures are intact, there should be no communication between the two joint spaces, a fact that we can use to our advantage during arthrography. Now that we have a basic understanding of the regional anatomy, I want to talk about patient positioning. Essentially, all of the neurovascular structures of the hand and wrist pass along the volar surface. Therefore, wrist injections or arthrography are almost always done using a dorsal or radial approach. Patients can either sit in a chair with their hand resting palm down on the fluoroscopy table, or they can be placed prone on the table with their hands held over their heads, again palm down in what we call the Superman position. I usually let the patient decide. Prior to the patient's arrival, you have to decide if you plan to do a one or two compartment injection. Of course, that decision is almost always based on the clinical situation. If the patient is scheduled for a steroid injection and pain relief for known isolated DJD of the radiocarpal joint, a single injection of the proximal wrist joint is probably sufficient. For all other clinical presentations, especially concerns for ligamentous injury, anticipate a two-compartment injection, which may or may not be necessary for reasons that will be clear in a moment. For the midcarpal injection, I will slowly rotate the wrist during fluoroscopy to lay out the small intracarpal joint space formed by the four carpal bones, the lunate, capitate, hamate, and triquetrum. Following a small amount of local anesthetic, a 25-gauge butterfly needle is fluoroscopically guided into the joint space. Again, under fluoroscopy, the needle is injected while slowly pulling back until contrast freely flows through the joint space. If all structures are intact, the contrast will be contained in the midcarpal or distal wrist joint space with no contrast identified in the radiocarpal joint. The radiocarpal injection can be done a couple of ways. Not well depicted in this particular model, there is a dorsal lip of the radius that partially obscures the joint space as seen on this sagittal MRI of the wrist. To expose the joint, we can volarly flex the wrist. This can be done by placing a small rolled towel under the distal forearm. A needle can then be fluoroscopically guided into the joint space and injected as before. Alternatively, the hand and wrist can remain flat and you simply ask the patient to deviate their wrist in an ulnar direction. This maneuver widens the radial side of the radiocarpal joint facilitating needle access. Remember that all of the neurovascular structures are on the volar side of the wrist, including the radial artery, which passes just anterior to the radiocarpal joint in this location. To avoid inadvertently puncturing the artery during arthrography, I try to stay on the posterior dorsal margin of the joint using the anatomic snuff box of the wrist as a landmark. 
The snuff box is bordered dorsally by the tendon of the extensor pollicis longus and volarly by the common tendon sheath of the extensor pollicis brevis and adductor pollicis longus. Extension of the thumb flexes the pollicis brevis and pollicis longus muscle bellies, accentuating their respective tendons, while adducting the thumb increases the distance between the two tendons, clearly defining the borders of the snuff box. Now let's look at an actual example. This particular patient was a 21-year-old soccer player who fell and was having persistent pain on the ulnar side of his wrist. Clinically suspected injury to the triangular fibrocartilage complex, or TFCC, a fibromeniscal and ligamentous structure located between the distal ulna, lunate, and triquetrium as depicted in this coronal MRI wrist arthrogram. The TFCC acts as a shock absorber and stabilizer of the ulnar aspect of the wrist and, therefore, is prone to injury. For this particular case, I planned a two-compartment injection, starting with the mid-carpal or distal wrist joint, again locating the joint space bordered by the four carpal bones, lunate, capitate, hamate, and triquetrum. After local anesthetic, a small-gauge butterfly needle was fluoroscopically guided into the joint space. The needle is then slowly pulled back while injecting until the contrast flows freely through the mid-carpal joint, as demonstrated on the fluoroscopic image and accompanying graphic. However, you can see on the later images of the arthrogram, there is a small amount of contrast now seen in the radiocarpal or proximal wrist joint, indicating disruption of one of the barrier structures between the proximal and distal joint spaces. Let's zoom in and look at the arthrogram a little closer. Almost immediately after injection, you can see a stream of contrast passing between the lunate and triquetrum, indicating a defect in the lunotriquetrial ligament, which was subsequently confirmed on the MR arthrogram performed immediately afterwards. This would be reported as a single compartment injection with contrast identified in the proximal and distal joint spaces consistent with a suspected ligamentous injury. Since contrast spontaneously entered the proximal joint space, there was no need to perform a second injection into the radiocarpal joint. A quick summary of wrist arthrography and relevant wrist joint anatomy. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.